Richland, and here's another episode of Raising Monarchs. The Raising Monarchs series used to be just parts one through five. Nowadays, there's a lot more videos out there, and so there's a lot of information. So I wanted to make a video that really talks about how to gauge and understand what your level of commitment is and can be. There's some things that you need to consider before you start doing something like this. And really, I've given a lot of this advice, but it's just all throughout my other videos, and I can't expect that somebody watching these videos has seen all of those videos at this point. So I wanted to take a lot of that information and just put it all into one video. Here are some things that maybe you should know before you get into doing this. And hey, if you're already doing this, this is still worth your time as far as some things to consider before you decide to take it to the next level or maybe scale back your operation. If you want to help out the monarch butterfly population east of the Rockies or really any population, I would say that there's two essential categories that you can be involved with. The first category, planting milkweed. The decline in the monarch population seems to be primarily due to a loss of habitat, a loss of milkweed options to lay their eggs on. So planting milkweed helps restore this habitat to them and gives them the options to lay their eggs. But I think the best way to do this is with seeds. When you have milkweed plants that are from seeds, then you don't have to worry about any type of pesticide that might have been sprayed on the plants if you're buying store-bought plants. So you really minimize any chance of it having some sort of unwanted chemical on there. There's been a few times where people have left comments letting me know that they bought a plant from a store and they were using it to feed their monarch caterpillars and that the monarch caterpillars ended up dying. Likely, that plant had a pesticide on it. And furthermore, if you're growing them from seeds, you don't have to worry about that mess of transplanting them into your yard if that's where you want to put the plant. I've heard of some people not having too much success with transplanting milkweed plants. I'm not saying it can't be done. I've heard some people tell me that they have been successful. I know I've never been successful, so I stopped trying. For me, seeds was the way to go. It was pretty easy to get my plants to end up growing. I have a four-part series on planting milkweed where I show how I collect seeds, how I germinate the seeds, and then how I ended up transplanting them into my yard. Here they are now. You can see that they're doing fine. And I also can trust that these don't have any pesticides on them. And I didn't have to worry about transplanting a plant and the failure involved sometimes with that. Now, if you're planting milkweed, let's be clear. You and I, we're friends. I'm a fan. You are totally helping out the monarch butterfly population. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. How much they appreciate it if they could talk. Because you're giving them places to lay their eggs. You're giving them options. Furthermore, milkweed plants, they also offer up nectaring flowers. Actually, every time I try to type in nectaring flowers, Google gives me that little red squiggle telling me I, that nectaring isn't a word. So I guess nectar producing flowers is better to say. Anyway, with the milkweed plant, you're also providing nectar, which helps out all pollinators. This is good anyway. All the pollinators aren't doing that great in North America. So having multiple different types of plants in your yard, in your garden, wherever you end up putting them, that are nectar producing plants, helps out the pollinators, helps out the monarchs. It provides the adults with well-needed food and nourishment and energy. And it definitely can lead to attracting some butterflies, not just monarchs, but plenty of beautiful ones, into your yard. And it helps out the honeybees. Now also, in planting the milkweed, you don't have to limit yourself to just your yard. I'm not saying go sprinkle them in some neighbor's yard. But are there natural areas where you live where you could put some seeds? Whether it is that you want to germinate them till they're little sprouts and then plant them there, or if you just want to throw some seeds around and see what happens, this is still also an option. When it comes to nature, these seeds just get scattered wherever the wind takes them. Having a human make some decisions as to where a better place is to put them can be helpful. Allowing a patch of milkweed or even just a few plants to grow in certain locations that aren't going to be devastated by other human actions. Now, the second category is actually raising the monarchs themselves. Based upon the kind of comments I get, I'm able to somewhat gauge what kind of information I either haven't put out there yet that you guys want, or some information that maybe I have put out there, but I just haven't made clear enough. When it comes to raising the monarchs, I really only mentioned this in the end of part five, but you gotta definitely make sure you gauge how much you can be responsible for. I'm a bit exaggerating here, but I have had comments that are kind of along the lines of, Hey, Rich, I've got like three monarch plants in my yard, and I'm kind of concerned that that's not going to be enough food for the 40 caterpillars that I've taken in. Again, going to extremes, but I think you get the idea. 
before you decide to take in monarch caterpillars, monarch eggs, and try to rear them, you must first make sure that you've got enough food source available for them. If you're looking at how much milkweed you have, either in your yard or just in your area, and you're thinking, yeah, I think I could do 10 monarchs, okay, cool, do six. When you're estimating, lowball that estimate. You see, depending upon which study you look at, out in nature, a monarch egg has either a 3% or a 10% chance, somewhere in there, of going from egg to adult. Mother Nature is not kind to monarchs. But if I were to take in an egg or a caterpillar, and then I'm not able to provide food for it, well, then I've actually lowered its chance of surviving. In fact, it'll probably drop down to zero if I can't provide any food for it. If you get into a situation where you thought you could take care of 20 caterpillars and you're running low on food for the last five of them, I don't know what kind of help or advice I can offer you. The best way to deal with a situation like that is to prevent it from happening in the first place. Next thing you gotta know going into this, there's going to be losses along the way. I hate to say it, but it's gonna happen. Let's highball it and say a 10% chance from egg to adult. That's out in nature. Well, even when you take them in, you can't expect a 100% success rate. Hey, maybe if you're only taking care of two, three, four, five, maybe even 10, maybe you do get a 100% success rate. Awesome. But if you're getting into numbers like 20, 30, 40, you're going to likely have some losses, even if you are keeping things very sanitary, you're making sure to care for them very much. If you're not ready to emotionally deal with that, then I would recommend not doing that part of it. Just plant the milkweed and call it good. But if you are venturing into raising the monarchs, then you are also volunteering to unfortunately experience some of these times when the monarch caterpillar that you've cared for doesn't make it to the adult status. I feel for you, but also it does happen. And that also does mean that if you're raising just a few, one, two, three, four, five, that you also might experience that maybe two, three, four, or all five don't make it. That can happen too. We can try to prevent this with sanitation, and I've got some videos on how to bleach treat your eggs, bleach treat your leaves to prevent a lot of the harmful infections down there in the description, but still, it is a possibility. And so if you're getting kids involved, maybe explain that to them as well. Everybody involved with raising the monarchs should know this before going into it. Now the last part to bring up too is that when it comes to raising the monarchs, understand if you aren't collecting the eggs, collecting the caterpillars, and bringing them into controlled environments, if instead you're just letting them do their thing on some plants in your backyard, they are still out in nature. And that's okay, you can let them do their thing. If that's the level of commitment that you can provide, that's still awesome. But understand, if eggs and caterpillars are on milkweed plants, whether that's out in the woods, out in some field, out in a park, or in your backyard, they are still out in nature. They are still subject to the whims of nature. All of the pests, predators, parasites, and extreme weather conditions that could take them out, they're still subject to. Mother Nature is completely brutal to eggs and caterpillars of butterflies. Again, out in nature, including your backyard. Best case scenario, 10% chance of them making it. So if you have a monarch butterfly that you witness laying about 10 eggs on your milkweed plants at home, understand statistically only one of them is going to make it to adulthood, and quite possibly Maybe all 10 don't. And I also want to stress that not everybody has the time that it takes to actually put them into controlled environments and rear them. And when I say controlled environments, understand I'm not talking about some sort of super clean lab that you set up in your house. I mean uh, to-go food containers and plastic terrariums like what I show in Raising Monarchs Part 2 and 3. Extreme weather is not going to get to them. Predators are not going to get to them. And while you still might need to be concerned with certain types of infections, whether they're parasites or viruses or bacterial infections that might be on your leaves, if you are bleach treating your eggs and bleach treating your leaves, then that also is almost 100% eliminated. I go into detail about these different types of monarch and milkweed pests and predators in the video called Pests and Predators, also in the description. So if you want further details on their specifics, go ahead and check that out. But for now, let's just say and point out that if you're leaving them on the plants, yep, they are subject to that kind of natural pest or predator interfering with them. If you take them into controlled environments, then you don't have to worry about those at all. And that's the solution that I got for you. In the core of the series, Raising Monarchs 1 through 5, I show you from the start to the finish what my procedure is. You don't have to do it exactly how I do it. That's up to you. You can make your own choices. 
I just wanted to get some videos out there that show you here's what I do and what I've had success with. Just understand also though if you deviate from my procedure and because of your deviation you run into some problems that I haven't had to deal with, I don't know that I have any good advice for you because I haven't really had to deal with that problem before. I can only really talk on what I know of, what I've encountered before, and I can tell you what I might do in your situation. But if you want to avoid those situations, keeping them in controlled environments is the best way to go. I really hope that none of that sounded harsh. You gotta believe me. I am not in any way trying to tell anybody what to do. What you want to do is up to you. It's your choice. And if you're planting milkweed, you're awesome. And if you choose to raise monarchs, you're awesome. I just wanted to put it all into one video, the things that I think I would want to know before getting involved with this. I'm Rich Lund. Thank you for checking this out. And I want to wish you luck on your Raising Monarchs season, whether it be planting milkweed or raising the monarchs themselves.